because what can be more fun than a presentation at 5 p.m. on Tuesday, the first day of a two and a half day seminar? It's nothing can be more fun than talking about exhibits, right? So we're going to be talking about using exhibits in depositions. We're going to be talking about laying foundation for exhibits. We're going to be going over the mechanics of using your exhibits. Um, I think we're going to try and make this a little interactive. So what that means in Cynthia and Robert's speak is we might pick on people. We're not going to tell you we're going to pick on people. We're just going to pick on maybe. Depends on how good Cynthia's feeling about it. You know, if she wants to be nice today. But, uh, put simply, since Judge Matt decided that he didn't use a remote, so we're not going to use a remote, I'm going to be going back and forth. And Cynthia's going to be going back and forth as we flip through the slides. You have a remote. You guys want to remote. That would be fantastic. <laughs> Nobody got the remote. You really you want to remote. Let me go grab it. Because going up and down those stairs is exercise <laughs> enough. So most depositions focus on one of four things, right? People, events, conversations, and documents. Our conversation today is going to be primarily about the documents, right? So, why are documents useful? Documents are useful, now I can figure out which one this is. And if I can get it to work. Okay. So now we have it. Documents are useful to assist in discovery, right? To help you to identify documents you don't have. To help to prod the witness's memory, right? Stick up the document in the witness's face, and it helps them to kind of write. Oh, right. Yeah. Helps to prod the witness's memory, and it helps to organize future examinations, right? And that's the back button. You see, that's forward. Next. <laughs> Documents are also helpful to help you gain admissions. Okay. There's going to be very little that you're going to find as useful as an exhibit in terms of helping to coax admissions from a hesitant or non-cooperative witness. The documents also help you to corroborate stories, tying witnesses and theories together. In your case analysis session, when you went through the good facts, bad facts, you also had a conversation about um, your case theory, right? As you are preparing for your deposition and you're thinking, okay, you've gathered your room full or your box full or your boxes full of documents, you want to be thinking about which documents go with your particular case theories. And deposition is one of the, the, your opportunities to kind of tie your witnesses and your case theories to particular documents. Finally, most fun part of the trial. Impeachment. Documents are key to help you with impeachment. And that's especially with respect to what kind of impeachment? Prior inconsistent statements. Yes. In impeachment, especially with respect to impeachment by prior inconsistent statement. <coughs> because that document may be the prior inconsistent statement, right? That letter, that email, um, that note, right? And eventually it's going to be, you know, your transcript is going to be that wonderful document that you use to impeach. So you're setting all of this up and you're thinking about all of this as you are preparing to do your deposition. So, first question is whether or not you're going to use a document. So what are some of the things you want to ask yourself first? Well, you want to ask yourself, um, you know, is this is this one of my good facts or my bad facts? How am I going to use this? So, you know, do I want to use it with the witness first, get the document out, start talking about it with the witness, or do I want to ask the witness about the content in the document 
and then see if it sort of rolls with the document or whether it's inconsistent. So how is it going to be useful? Um, you're going to want to think about um, what questions you're going to need to ask about each document. So uh, you're going to get out all your documents using this case uh, material as an example. You're going to look through all those documents with each of these witnesses and figure out which ones am I going to use. And um, for each of those documents, you're going to want to think about how am I going to authenticate this document? Why? Why would you go to the trouble of doing that in a deposition? Well, you might really need that, that document later at trial. And what if that witness who authenticated it, um, what if the person you're deposing is like, ah, I think I'll skip this for today, and that person's unavailable at trial. So if that document's important, or even if you just want to make sure you're thorough, it doesn't take that much time, authenticate your document. How are you going to do that? Which question are you going to ask? Um, what can you learn about other discovery from looking at this document? We'll show you an example of that in a little bit here, but what kind of other stuff does this document suggest might be out there? If it's a memo to a file, for example, where's the file? If it uses a plural, what are the other things? What other documents? Are there a whole bunch of documents in this format of this document that you just got one somehow? So think about how you can obtain other discovery, other ideas of stuff that you didn't get yet, maybe because you didn't describe it well in your RFP or because it just didn't get produced to you. You can use the document, of course, to obtain admission, admissions. So what in this document is really going to be a good piece of your case that you want to get the other side to admit? And of course, to impeach. The document says one thing, they've said another thing, either in a conversation that you've already learned about, or maybe even in another document. So, after you've articulated these objectives, you want to finalize them, right? Again, we're now still in the preliminary stages. We've decided we're going to do a deposition. We've identified the exhibits we're going to use. We're thinking about how do we prep for this deposition, whether or not we use the documents. So you just heard some of the objectives. You want to finalize those objectives, and then you want to structure your questions to meet the objectives that you set. Right? This is all making sense, right? <laughs> the five o'clock blues. So, one of the things you want to think about is how do I make sure that these documents don't control me, but I am controlling the documents? You ask yourself, would testimony be better? Do I need to use a document at all? Do I want to do both? Not trick questions, real questions. Okay? Would it be better to simply ask the witness some questions? and then follow up with the documents. Is that going to be too repetitive for this particular point? Do I just go with the document? Right? Ask yourself those questions and make that final <coughs> determination before you go in. You're not doing it on the fly. You want to use your documents to A, refresh recollection if appropriate, B, direct the witness's attention to particular subject areas of inquiry, or C, Facilitate gathering of additional information. All right? Because the last thing we want to do is use that set of documents as a crutch. How many times have you gone into a deposition, or sometimes, hopefully, none of us have done this, see people go into a deposition and their entire outline is a stack of documents? First question. And they start asking questions of the document. Next set of questions. Next document. So they're actually being driven by the documents themselves, not necessarily using the documents as supplements or using the documents in terms of, in a cohesive fashion, uh, fashion to achieve a set objective. So, we're going to talk about getting a clear record. How do you ensure that you have a clear record during your deposition? It's really important. To, uh, to do this because it's very easy when you're thinking about the content of your questions and what you want to get out that you forget to say the February 13th, 2007 um, widget contract. Okay? You need to make sure that whatever that descriptor is lines up with the document number and that you either refer to it as the document number once it's been marked or you refer to it by the title of the by the, the title of the document itself. And I used to get kind of all you know kerfuffle about this, but what I've started doing is I know, and I don't know, there might be 
be some litigation you're doing where this is impossible. But in many cases, there's a certain set of key documents. And you know that you're going to be using those. And they might be in chronological order or maybe some other kind of sensical order. And you can just create names for those that you can use in the deposition and pre-mark them so that every time you refer to them, it's easy to refer to them and you can remember what they're called and what number they are. So like preparing for your deposition from a practical <coughs> standpoint, right, in terms of the logistics. You know that when you go in and you're using a document, first thing that the court reporter has to do is... Right. So to the extent you can pre-mark the documents, you have assisted in the flow of your deposition, right? You want to assemble your working sense. What does that mean? Typically, you're in the deposition. How many parties are in there at minimum? Represented. There's you. There's opposing counsel. There's court reporter. There's a witness. How many sets of documents is that? That was a trick question. <laughs> exactly. Why? You, you're going to have your working set, okay? From a practical standpoint, that's your set of documents. It probably has your notes on it. It probably has a little annotations. Hopefully not Schmidt-like annotations, but your notes, okay? <laughs> then there is the set that's going to be the actual exhibit copy, the exhibit set. That's the court reporter's set. That's the set that's going to the witness, right? And then, depending on how voluminous your exhibit sets are, Maybe you want to have a set for opposing counsel because they're definitely going to want to see it before you pop it in front of the witness. Now you're going to sit there for you know five, ten minutes every time. So slow poke is like well, no, you know. So if your case permits it, if your budget permits it, you have one set. You're like counsel, that's yours, and you have the set for the witness, which is the set that's going to go in, and you have yours. Separate and apart, typically, from the original exhibits. Why? You heard it earlier. You don't want to run the risk of having that original document set in any way, shape, or form compromised. All right? So you think about and assemble your working sets. We talked about tying documents to theories earlier. In the interest of time, we're going to repeat that as well as tying to the witnesses. So, practically speaking, in terms of marking the documents, what does that entail? Marking the documents for identification, to reduce confusion. How many times have you, I, you, been using a document and that document somehow becomes this? I am showing you this. Do you recognize it? What is that? Okay. Documents have, during the course of the deposition, or actually during the course of the case, three names, proper names. The first is the name they were born with, their descriptor name. It is an email from Jack Smith to Tony Brown, dated February 22nd, 2010. Right? That's its birth name name it was given when it was first created. Then it has its second formal name, which is its identification, its name for purposes of identification. So it's being marked plaintiff exhibit one for ID. Right? And then later on when we get into trial and it's actually offered into evidence, it becomes plaintiff exhibit one. No longer for ID, that's its proper name. So throughout the course of the document's life and its role in this trial or this proceeding, you're going to use one of those three names. Because when you first show it to the witness, I'm showing you an email from Jan Smith to Tony Brown. Do you recognize Exhibit 1 for ID? Or do you recognize um, the Lauren Deposition Exhibit 1? Okay, that's its formal name for purposes of the deposition. And for your record, you need to make sure that you use it. Sometimes you have documents that are compound exhibits or they're multi-page exhibits. How do you deal with that? Because, for example, we're going to touch on this a little bit 
It's a string email. It has 16 pages. And it doesn't have a formal title. How do you deal with that? Base number. So I've given you composite exhibit 23, base number 001 to 0023. Why do we do that? Why do we go through that additional worry to make sure we properly identify the document? Because at some point in time there's going to be a trial of fact who's trying to find and identify this document. And if it's only been called this, that, that email, then how are they going to know exactly which document you're talking about and what's the page range? So you want to pay careful attention to making sure that you have properly identified it, you're using its proper name, and to the extent that it has base numbers, which should, right? You're using those base numbers. So, by way of suggestion, how do we organize our documents in terms of prepping for a deposition? One suggestion, and the one I like to use, is chronologically. It's not the only way, but why do I do that? Being not the most organized person on the planet, what usually happens is, I'm not the guy who's going to be able to go, uh, it's right there in the box. But I am the guy who, somewhere in the course of the deposition, the witness says something, and I'm like, And I need to find that email because I've decided that I'm going to ask a question about that email for whatever reason right now. And it's probably not in my outline in that spot. How do I find the document? Well, if it's November 22nd, 2010, then chronologically I can find it. Even more important, I can put it back and then find it again <laughs> when I need to get there. So Robert, let me ask you a question about something that used to really make me nervous as, as, a, as a person doing my early depositions. If I did that, and I had marked exhibits 1 through 100, and I suddenly realized I need to ask somebody about exhibit 82, did you feel constrained at all about pulling 82 out and starting to ask questions about it, like right in the middle of your deposition, in between you know, exhibit 20 and 81? I mean, how does do, that work? Do I? Absolutely not. Why? Because if I need to do that, and I go exhibit 21, and it's pre-marked, okay? It's one of those cases where you have a gazillion exhibits, you've pre-marked it, the court reported it, this is the fifth deposition they're doing in your case, so they've given you those pre-marked empty stamps, and your paralegal has, has filled in everything, I have absolutely no problem going 1, 2, 3, 22, 23, four, five, six. Why? Because if, for whatever reason, I don't use exhibits 15 through 20, and the transcript is just going to show exhibits 20, 15 through 20, not used. See, that's beautiful. It gives you control and freedom at the same time. Right. So, we've marked documents. I think this thing is set to sabotage. So now you've marked them. We're going to use them. How do we go about that? All right, so we, we talked a little bit about this already. You identify the document for the record. I am showing you the email from uh, Stan Schmidt to female employees uh, dated February 13th. <coughs> Show it to the witness. You provide the copy uh, to uh, the opposing counsel, probably at the same time. Um, it's been pre-marked, so now your deposition is flowing nice and smoothly. You don't have to wait for the court reporter to mark it. It's been marked for identification as exhibit one. And you ask the witness then to identify the document. Everyone has a copy of it. Everything's moving really smoothly. Um, the last point here is always refer to the identification number in the questions. Yes, that is totally a great idea. The only thing I would say about that is I have had litigation with a lawyer who would be preference to every single question would say, I'm showing you exhibit one, the blah, 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 blah. I think that occasionally, as long as you don't say this, if you just say exhibit one for a few questions, kind of keep in mind it's like a novel when you can't figure out who the speaker is anymore. They kind of tell you again who's speaking. You know, and for the, your appellate lawyers, um, appellate, you know, say it again. But in every single question, I don't know, what do you think about that? It, it gets terribly redundant and repetitive when this particular lawyer does that. 
it gets monotonous, it gets redundant, and it's one of the things you want to think about in terms of, is it absolutely necessary, right? So here, even though we're saying there are certain things you don't overlook and there are certain things that you have to make sure you pay attention to, the flip side is, if you don't need to do it, don't. Okay, so then it's time to lay the foundation. Now, I know many of you are looking quizzically at me. Not necessarily. But why do we say lay the foundation? Because the foundation laid for a document during deposition can also be used at trial if for some reason the witness later becomes unavailable. Now imagine this. You have gone through the deposition. It's Mr. Schmidt. You have taken those emails. You've asked him about those emails. He has admitted to every single one of them. He told you he thought that joke was hilarious. So he sent it around to everybody. And you went, yes! Two weeks later, Mr. Schmidt, going down the road, saw this beautiful lady and go, woo, he's crossing the street and he gets hit by a bus. <laughs> <laughs> Schmidt happens. <laughs> I just made that one up. <laughs> subsequently becomes unavailable and you are given permission to use that deposition testimony as trial testimony. The fact that you have laid that foundation during the deposition means the exhibit comes in as well. Had you not done that, which I'm sure none of you would do, but had you not done that, you would find yourself in this awkward position where the transcript comes in, but the exhibit and the section of the transcript dealing with that exhibit doesn't. Who wants that? Right? Um, you also want to consider laying that foundation for purposes of summer judgment. Because, as we all know, you know, if you have a really finicky lawyer and a really knowledgeable judge, there are arguments that can be made that if the exhibit is not admissible, Right? at trial, then it can't be used for summer judgment. So why take the risk? Why allow that window? Get it done when you can. Um, foundation as well, you heard earlier, is one of those objections which is curable. So A, you need to lay it so that if you need to do it, you um, need to use the, the foundation in trial, it has been laid. But B, if you don't, and there is a subsequent objection, then unfortunately, the objection will stand. Okay? So the lack of foundation is a curable problem, and for purposes of defending the deposition, if you don't make that objection at the time, you waive it. So, what are the mechanics of actually getting the deposition in? This is now by way of summary as you just heard Cynthia talk to you about some of the steps that you need to take. The first thing you need to do is mark it, which we've done because we've pre-marked the position. Then you need to show it to the other side, right? After you've shown it to the other side, you show it to the witness. Then you lay the foundation and then you offer it if you expect that it's going to be needed at trial. That last step, admittedly, may be a little superfluous during the deposition, but if it's something you're worried about, if it's something that you believe may be an issue, do it. If you don't think it's going to be an issue, that last one in terms of offering it, I skip it. Why? Because if it becomes an issue, the fact that you have done all the other steps means the offering stage is when you're offering the transcript at trial then that's when you're actually offering everything that goes along with that transcript, technically. So, MOFO is essentially the mechanics of, for those of you who like to use those little tools. Um, I don't know why you're all smirking, because uh, all I said was mark it, <laughs> show it to the other side, show it to the witness, 
lay the foundation and offer. So, the funnel, the funnel, the funnel. That's an ode to you, O Honorable Church. <laughs> when do we get to the funnel? The funnel? We get to the funnel now. The funnel technique, which you've heard a little bit about, and you're going to be hearing a lot more about, applies equally to exhibits as it applies to every other part of the deposition. And we would suggest that you apply the funnel technique with respect to how you handle and treat your documents, just as you would the funnel technique for every other portion of your deposition. In terms of dealing with your documents, it's the same open-ended questions. Who, what, where, when, why, explain, describe. Exact same thing, you've been hearing before and you're going to hear ad nauseum throughout the next two and a half days. Then when you've gotten those first top of the funnel questions, then you deal with continuing to prod, continuing to explore the lines of inquiry. What else? You continue to create parallel lines in terms of the specific document. Okay? Step three, you refresh memory with leading questions. I'm going through this a little bit quickly because when we get into the specific discussion on the funnel tomorrow, we're going to be talking in more detail about this. So step three of the funnel is you refresh memory. Did you, do you, what about? And then you recap what you, the information that you have obtained about the specific documents. Okay? Now we're going to talk about dealing with specific exhibits. How do we mine for information in these exhibits, make, making sure that we have pulled everything out from a particular exhibit? This is what some call mapping the document, and this is Who are the adopters? Who are the ratifiers? 
How does that process work? Um, and the anti-harassment policy. Um, did this ever happen? Was it ever discussed before? Um, is it in writing? Is it available? Is it oral? Who suggested it? Who said maybe we shouldn't do it? What drafts ever got made of it? Um, and then the notice, same kind of questions. Uh, you know, what did it ever happen? Who has it? Um, and just little things, like, you know, just noticing, like, who is SR? Just send the new initials, you know, I don't, I don't know if that corresponds with any of our players, but maybe we have a new person that we don't even know about. Um, so you want to know who SR is? Um, and, you know, same question about Taylor. And why are they getting copies of this? And, you know, were there any blind copies that were sent to anyone? Was this, you know, what did they do with them? Uh, where are they now? Should I be deposing them? Uh, so you think you can learn all these things just from this one little simple memo? So, there are certain questions that you will have to ask about any document. Doesn't matter which document it is, I'm going to go out on a limb and I'm going to say there are a certain set of universal questions that you can ask about any document. Right? First, when was this document prepared? Right? Why was the document prepared? Who prepared? You starting to see the trend here? <laughs> Who, what, when, where, exactly. You know, are there any earlier drafts of this document? You know, Cynthia and I were talking earlier. And, you know, she said, hmm, I wonder if that applies to police reports. I was thinking, you bet it applies to police reports. Can you imagine, you know, I, I love criminal practice, but I don't do it. Can you imagine if some rookie officer wrote up a report, and he goes and he gives it to the supervisor, and the supervisor says, what are you, nuts? We've never got a fun fiction on this. Puts it in a drawer, and goes, you got to write it this way. You know, victim at art. Defendant alighted from the vehicle <laughs> or tossed a small object into the gutter. You know, you gotta say it that way. Can you imagine if there was another earlier draft that you would get? You always have to ask, are there any notes pertaining to the document? Okay, where is the original document? Where is it kept? What are we talking about here? If we're talking about where the document is kept, Best evidence, business record, rule. These are all things that you're trying to establish in your deposition, right? You get answers to these questions and they help you to determine admissibility. You lay your laying foundations for admissibility later. Who received the document? Was anything attached to it? Especially now when we're going to be talking about emails in a little bit uh, and electronic documents. Um, how many times have you seen an email where Clearly there's an indicator that there's an attachment, but you don't have it, right? These are things you need to explore. Is there anything missing from the document? So universal questions that you should always ask. How do you, Ms. Witness, interpret this document? What does it mean to you? What else can you tell me about the document? Have you told me everything about this document? Right? Is there something about this document that just looking at it, not being in the company, not being involved in the transaction, not being a part of this particular incident, I wouldn't know. Is there anything else or have you told me everything about this document? So, conclusion. Have a plan. So, you're going to know what you want to do. In this case, you've got your theory. Okay. Um, if you're really on the ball, you're going to have almost a global plan. It's going to be beyond just this deposition. So you're going to have this plan and you're going to have these key documents. I mean, you might get some along the way. You can always add to the back of your list, right? But you're going to have a plan and you're going to mark all these documents. Then you want to make sure you clearly identify the documents, right? So this is in summary. You've clearly marked and identified your documents because A, one, if you go in, your documents aren't properly identified, they're not properly base numbered, they're not properly marked in terms of pre-marking for identification, it's going to be nigh on impossible to keep track of them. Even worse, it's going to be impossible to identify a particular document when reading that transcript code. So you want to make sure that your documents are clearly identified. 
to test the foundations of those documents, you're going to make sure for every one of those documents that, especially as you evolve through the case and you know which ones are really important, you're going to make sure that as you take your depositions, you get the foundations for those documents so you'll be able to use them at trial. Then, back to that theme of not having the documents <laughs> control the deposition, not using the documents as a crutch, you want to make sure that you're the one controlling the documents. As you're organizing and preparing for your deposition, how are those documents being used throughout the course of your deposition? Right? Are you going to front load the documents, which to me, without context, sounds like a pretty bad idea. There's something in your case that dictates that it's a document-intensive holding, right, to your deposition of this witness. Who knows? But it seems like it's going to be a more logical organization if the documents are interspersed throughout the course of the deposition. And obviously, they track the different topic areas that you're covering. I mean, how many times have you seen someone go through a deposition without proper organization, and then there is just this block at some point where they're admitting, like, or, you know, putting 30 documents on the record because the position is over, they're at, you know, hour six and a half, federal rules say you got seven, you didn't ask for any more, and they need to get them all in, so they're like, you recommend that? How about this? How about that? <laughs> right? And that's what the transcript looks like. Well. Good luck when you try to use that deposition at some later point. Mm -hmm. And even more, good luck trying to get a jury to pay attention to it. Uh, control the documents, don't let them control you. The, the, the beauty in this idea is that, especially now, when fewer and fewer cases are tried, when you go into a deposition and you have the documents laid out that are important in the case, and you can, with facility, pull one up if you decide that you want to skip to a later date. And you kind of can tell the story with using the documents as they apply. You are showing the opposing counsel from the get-go that you have totally got this case understood. Sure, you might learn some things in deposition you didn't know before, and you might learn some things that you didn't know that you didn't know. But you're setting the tone of, I know the landscape here. I've got my documents, I've got my questions, and it's, it's, it's a wonderful feeling when you come out of a deposition like that because everybody kind of gets, this person can try that case, this person understands that case, and it really starts in a deposition where you have that kind of control, and you're controlling the documents, and they're not controlling. So this is the fun part of this exercise because this is where we kind of bleed the second session into the first session. This is where we get interactive, and this is where we hopefully finish early, right, Judge Matt? Okay, because now we're going to talk about electronic documents. Emails, blogs, chat rooms, and all those wonderful things that we don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> At least three people are paying attention. <laughs> okay, why is this interesting? Why is this so fascinating? Why is Robert so excited about this? I am because I don't know the answers. Why? Because it's so new. Why is it so new? Because instead of dealing with a letter that has letterhead, it has all the usual indicia, address to, establish me, address, from, yours truly, Alice Rowe. We no longer have that. What we have are emails, dear S, or S, long to see you, you know, L-O-L, what the hell? <laughs> That's how people communicate, and unfortunately, it's also a part of our, it's becoming more and more a part of our lexicon. It's becoming more and more a part of how people communicate, even in business. So, as attorneys, dealing with this issue, you're going to have to figure out, A, is that something I can authenticate? Is that something that's ultimately going to be admissible? If so, how do we authenticate it? If so, how does it become admissible? 
how do I deal with it in depositions? So that's kind of a little bit of the conversation that we're going to start having right now for a few minutes. Okay? So, with respect to emails, with respect to electronic documents, the federal rules have been relaxed a little bit in recent years to, one, allow for the authentication of these types of electronic communications and electronic documents. Right? I would suggest that you start paying close attention to Federal Rule of Evidence 902. Um, 902 sub 7 is the subsection that some of these documents in some circuits have been allowed uh, authentication and um, ultimately admissibility. Why? Because the courts have started to look to whether or not we can find additional ways of finding indicia of authenticity and reliability. So, instead of the usual letterhead at the top in nice fancy colors with all of the partners' names down the side for this particular company and, you know, that signature block, is there some other type of signature block that's, you know, standard in the email? Is there a standard email signature block that goes out with all of these emails? Um, is there some other way to identify that this email was a part of a particular project file? Is there something else that the court can look to to determine that this email is authentic? So, yeah, I mean, so if, you, if you look at some of those signature blocks, they, they might have a firm logo on them, they might have the website, um, they might have phone numbers that are, you know, the person's uh, contact, so all of those things that make it look highly reliable that this is what it purports to be is going to be argument you can use to authenticate those emails. So Cynthia is sitting across the table from me in a deposition, and I whip out an email or a set of emails. 16 pages long. Right. And I go to the email that's on top, the last one. And the email on top is from Tanya Stokes, and it goes to Alice. And Tanya is forwarding to Alice some emails that she had received way, way back from Mr. Walsh, because he had received it from Schmidt. Because I want to admit that top email. Well, I don't know, just thinking off the cuff, I mean, the, the problem with that one is it may not have the signature block at the bottom. Those things don't necessarily roll forward. So, theoretically, what, you could start at the bottom, you could show that everything gets copied, it's the same email address all the way along, but you may get some of it and some, eventually may get some of it in and some not of it. What do you think? Anybody else? The problem is you can edit a lot of those previous comments too, so you can't really authenticate it. You know, that there wasn't any change along with the email chains. You have basically a folder with all of them to sign declarations and things like that. Or wrote at that time. So, and who would remember that? Right. <laughs> so Thomas raises an important point. Yeah. You know, on, on one hand, we know how forward the emails work. If I get an email and I click forward, does that preclude me from going into the email down below and switching something? No. It does not. But, this is why this is exciting. <laughs> there are courts that have said, so what? You can forge a letter as well. I can take, I can stroll into your office. You know, I'm here to clean the air ducts. Grab a stack of your letterhead and pocket them. So now I'm sending out the, uh, letters using Thomas's letterhead. And if there's anybody here who doesn't think I can forge his signature. Uh, uh. Okay, so... For those of you that practice in Washington State, there is a recent Division Three case that you're going to find very helpful. It deals primarily with photographs and, you know, uh, photographs taken from smartphones, but also text messages and it adopts a North Dakota holding. That case is State
State versus Andrews, you're going to find it at 172 Washington Appellate 703. And basically the court, Division Three, and Division Three has been doing a lot of work in this area over the last five years. Division Three basically adopted a very common sense approach. The approach was, you know, we don't need special rules of evidence. Our existing rules of evidence deal, just as Robert and Cynthia are saying, they already deal with issues of authenticity. And so long as you come forward with some evidence that the thing is what it purports to be, okay, now the burden shifts to the other party. For those of you that are evidence junkies, I also offer you the University, or rather the Nebraska Lawyer, that's the Nebraska Bar Journal, uh, from November of 2011. There's a very short, but it's a very, very good article that essentially just lays out this is how web-based admissibility works. It specifically deals with the admissibility of web-based uh, evidence. And earlier that year, in January of 2011, who'd have thought it's Nebraska? Okay, I'm admitted to Nebraska, so I'm a little biased. There was a, again, a wonderful article. This was on cloud-based evidence, evidence that exists in the cloud and how you authenticate it. So there's some great authorities out there, and I'll tell you, every single one of them is doing exactly what Cindy and Robert have said. Very common sense. Is the thing what it purports to be? The existing rules provide us the tools to do that. So, you have a very articulate counsel who has stood up and he has given all the reasons why this is authentic. He has said the rules as they are allow us to authenticate this email using the rules as they are. There's no change required. Courts have said it's perfectly fine. So, it's in. Yes? Depends. Why? Because that's just authenticity. Is it admissible? Then you have to start thinking about are there barriers to admissibility? Right? In law school, I was never this excited about evidence. <laughs> <laughs> this was an interesting stuff. Right? Now we have to start thinking about admissibility. Now you have to start looking at is there hearsay in this document? Is there hearsay within hearsay? Because they, Tanya, what's her name? say that John Walsh said that Stanley Schmidt said and is that all a part of the forward which was then forwarded which was then forwarded so you have to be dealing with that why am I why am I talking about this now why are we talking about this because it's going to be in that deposition that you're going to have to either a establish why it is or b make sure you undercut the bases for its admissibility, or at least be thinking about it. Then, what if that wonderfully articulate lawyer decides that this was sent at work, and it was on the work server, which makes it a business record? Questions, concerns, <laughs> objections. Because is Stanley's naughty email actually set in the course of business? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Judge Matt says yes, but He's just trying to build morale. <laughs> See, like I said, his job. wonderfully articulate lawyer trying to articulate why this dirty email was a part of Stanley's morale building job responsibilities. <laughs> but your answer is going to be Such a sucker. I need somebody who is going to cut <laughs> this. That's, that, that's the first attack on hearsay, not offered for the truth of the matter asserted. But in terms of somebody trying creatively to sneak some email in as a business record, you have to be prepared to deal with that. You have to be prepared to attack it. And to the extent that you expect that there is something that is going to come in and you're deposing the person through whom it's going to come in, you have to be prepared and thinking about asking those questions to later attack that attempt to bring it in, right? So when we're going through all of this mundane talk about collecting the documents, organizing them, thinking about the questions you're going to be asking, finalizing your objectives, this is why. Because if you don't attack during that deposition, 
the basis for their claim that this is a business record, you may have lost the opportunity. Because if he sits there in the deposition and he says, oh, no, no, it wasn't part of work. It's just something I like to do sometimes. And I don't have my regular computer, so I just pour it. Then they can't claim it's a business record, can they? Well, I'm thinking about those documents and, and the fact that you're going to need them might lead to whole er new areas of inquiry. Maybe you want to ask Walsh, you know, do you guys send email at work back and forth to each other? What, what kind of things do you expect to see in the emails? Do you, do you, do you allow personal emails? Maybe you can establish the things that Walsh says that really this is kind of a business record for them because this is kind of basically what they do. Or maybe it'll go the other way. But if you're thinking ahead about those documents, then you have these lines of questions that, that will occur to you and you can use that to develop the foundation of the depositions long before anybody else is thinking about, this, are they going to try to use a business record exception to get this in? So really kind of front loads that whole process for you. What about web pages? So you better figure out some argument, right? And you need to be able to determine, am I dealing with an authenticity issue? Is that picture what it purports to be? I think we get past that. But then from an admissibility standpoint, can Vicky be the person through whom it is admitted? Is that something you want to deal with in deposition or should deal with in deposition? Or are you just going to wing it? Because I know Judge Matt wants to make a law. Because nobody else has written that in. So he might come in and he might go, well, being the cutting edge judge that I am, I think. And there goes your argument. Right? So this part we thought was exciting for these reasons. Um, questions, concerns, you're like, you gave me absolutely no answer. Dude. <laughs> I know. But we would say rule 902, yes. In a world without without rules, is there are there best practices we can follow to limit to put ourselves in the best position possible? Well, let's not be too flip. I wouldn't say there are no rules. Um, as the judge just said, the, 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 the so far, so far, the federal courts that have handled this issue have essentially come down on A, the federal rules with respect to authentication, and we just heard about some state rules with respect to authentication, exist. Okay? And they believe that they have said that those rules are sufficient to deal with this brave new world of electronic documents. That said, there are certain complications that you have to anticipate because of the nature of these documents, the forwards, the blogs, the pulling from different sources, which don't necessarily affect the authenticity of the material. It affects the admissibility of the material. And we have to anticipate that. So it's not so much that there are no rules, it's that we have to be a little bit more proactive in terms of anticipating the problems, to the extent that we're trying to get them in. And we have to be a little bit more aggressive in terms of challenging the admissibility and sometimes authenticity of these documents to the extent that we're opposing them. Because God forbid, you know, you don't, then the floodgates are open and A, you can't challenge Vicky trying to admit something that she took from Thomas's Facebook page, who took it from Matt's Facebook page, who pulled it off of his friend in Bali. Just because it was on her page. Is that sufficient? Is that sufficient for you? Not for me, but... Can, 
confusion and complication is the enemy of action. That is true both as a lawyer, as a human being, and especially as a judge. The more complicated something is, the less likely your judge is going to want to do something about it. So if you're trying to get something in, your job here is to make it simple. There are five, count them five, legal issues in the admissibility of any document. Five, count them five. Issue one, is it authentic? That's the nine of nine hundreds, the federal rules and the state rules. Issue number two, is it relevant? That's the four hundreds. Issue number three, is it hearsay? And again, as we know, there are <coughs> two elements we're not going to talk about hearsay and the details of it, but we've been talking about it. Issue number four, that is, is it the best evidence? That doesn't mean, is there better evidence? It means, is it the original document? By the way, that Division Three case that I just referenced has a great analysis about <coughs> electronically reproduced copy being an original as defined under the best evidence rule. You find that in ER 10001, the 10 hundreds. Okay? And then finally, there's privilege. That's the universe of legal issues. So as we think about electronic evidence, Let's not overcomplicate this. Our job, if we want to admit it, make it as simple as possible. You have a witness with knowledge as to where this thing came from. And if you want to get really complicated, and I remember back in the day when we have to, had to admit radar tracks from the, from the various air traffic control systems. And this was an incredibly complicated process because at that time, they didn't have the web-based technologies. It was kind of new, and all of the judges were real suspicious. Sound kind of familiar? Okay? And judges were sort of uncomfortable with this whole electronic. So we literally had to bring in the technicians who could testify how they calibrated using different metal uh, things that were at various locations around the world. So we had to bring in those technicians to testify to that. But at the end of the day, it was really very simple. We started with a witness with knowledge who authenticated the accuracy of what we were measuring, and then how it then was translated into something that walked into court. So at the end of the day, don't overcomplicate this. Witness with knowledge, walk it forward. So Judge, I haven't done this yet, but I had a case recently and I was considering wanting to do it because I wanted some juicy stuff off of a hospital's website, and I had considered Try, you know, sending the appropriate discovery to identify the designer or creator of the website who would supposedly tell me who wrote the content that I thought was so good for my case. Would that be one way to kind of get at that, uh, like your fact witness in that, in that other situation you're talking about? Absolutely. And remember, especially if you're in civil litigation, you have a host of discovery tools. Request for admission. Send them a copy of the website. Okay, either electronically or on paper. Send them a copy of it. Admit. This is your website. An interrogatory, and identify, a request for production, give me the code, okay? And if you practice in Washington State, oh, bless our hearts, we have ER 904, which is, it is in the, it's in the authentication rules, but it's not a rule of authentication. It's a rule of admissibility, which basically says, you print out a copy of that, you send it to them more than 30 days prior to trial, with and basically say, you know, this is a copy of your website. And if they don't object within 14 days, it is deemed, not admitted, and not authentic, admissible. It's a rule of admissibility. So again, know the rules, don't overcomplicate. And remember, a witness with knowledge is going to be how you lay foundation. Authentication, relevance. Sometimes those two are tied together. Hearsay, best evidence. 